Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor Asta. Okay, so we have Sana with us. Hi, Asta. Can Hi, everybody. Me? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, Salim. How are hmm. you? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes, Asta. We can. I cannot hear you. Why? I hear Salim. Mm -hmm. Something is uh, is wrong with Asta's connection. I can also hear you, Nisar, uh, but it seems like Asta. Yes. Has can you hear me? Oh, yeah, sorry, I can hear you. But I cannot hear you. Mm -hmm. Anyone that can talk? Now, yes, perfect, wonderful, mm -hmm. I can hear you. Okay, now it's fine. So uh, we have Saleh this afternoon with us and I would like to introduce Saleh um, as a very prominent uh, researcher. And he's currently in London South Bank University, but actually his journey, his career, started in Spain, right? Correct. And, uh, and with postdoc in Montpellier University. So uh, he really independently and very smartly mastered his uh, pathway research career to uh, senior assistant professor in, in UK University. Uh, so I believe this lecture is about uh, how to manage your research ambitions, research quality, but also strategically um, address uh, where you spend your time and with whom you spend your time to, to have um, career success, right? Correct, yes. So uh, this is uh, something that is very needed to uh, PhD students and peer-to-peer uh, -peer experience sharing. Um, I believe is very efficient. Um, so that's why uh, we're very happy to host Saleh as our visiting uh, professor, lecturer. Uh, so any questions uh, are welcome. So Saleh is open for the questions as well. So let's uh, give a floor to Saleh. I believe that uh, it's like one hour and a half in total. So uh, certain time Saleh will use for presentation and then we can have a discussion um, on the topics that are really interesting for you in this regard. Okay, so Salev, the floor is yours and uh, uh, then we will have a discussion. Okay, thank you very much Asta for the kind introduction. Hello everybody, I'm very happy to be uh, with you. Um, uh, I thought it would be good to share some uh, recent experience. Uh, I will uh, share with you my experience uh, things that I learned myself after uh, finishing my PhD uh, inside the job market uh, in Europe uh, with all its, let's say, ups and downs and uh, some tips that I thought is important for, for career planning. Uh, I, if I understand correctly, everybody here uh, uh, is a, a, a PhD student, right? Or, uh, or fresh researchers, am I right? Apart from Asta, uh, the rest are uh, okay. Good. So I will start with uh, uh, introducing myself. So at this moment, I uh, uh, I am a senior lecturer in uh, innovation and enterprise in the School of Business, London South Bank University. Um, but up until uh, recently, uh, I was with uh, 
the HECO project, the European uh, Union funded project that Asta leads, and there was in University of uh, Montpellier as a postdoctoral researcher. But as I will tell you my, my story, you will see that I started this uh, PhD a little uh, while after I had uh, already finished my uh, my PhD. So I started the, the postdoc uh, uh, three, uh, four, five years after uh, finishing the PhD. And I will tell you why. So I want to kind of tell you what is my, my journey around this, then the things that I learned uh, in the job market. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, all of the time, of course, at, at every moment that uh, you, you thought you have a question or comment, please feel free to, uh, uh, to just uh, uh, say it. Uh, you, you can, I think you can uh, use your microphone right away. And then uh, hopefully we are going to have some time for discussion in the end. Um, so uh, the let's say focus uh, of the talk today is job market for PhD graduates uh, or fresh PhDs in uh, business and management. Uh, the things that you want to kind of uh, achieve or cover uh, by the end of the talk today. First of all, uh, we should know that there are different career paths for researchers. Um, some people are uh, always with the idea that, okay, if you are doing a PhD, it is because you want to carry, follow, a, follow an academic career after that. Well, that view is, is challenged uh, nowadays. Uh, uh, I just uh, um, saw uh, a workshop in my university the, the other week that was about, I have a PhD and I don't want to do a to do an academic career, what are my options? So of course, there are other options out there, uh, like industry, like consulting, uh, and so on. Uh, it also depends a lot on what area of uh, business and management uh, you are graduated in. Some areas that are more quantitative, uh, or the, uh, some areas that learn quantitative skills, uh, like finance, or some, some branches of marketing, or, or any other idea that, uh, area that is quantitative, they have uh, a lot of demand outside the, the market. But I want to stay today within the realm of, let's say, academic uh, job market, because that's still the primary uh, and the, the largest uh, uh, number of graduates. They do uh, go for academic jobs after uh, graduation from a PhD program. So that's uh, the focus. Then, uh, we want to think a little bit about uh, our own uh, career plans. Uh, we want to kind of be self-aware of uh, what uh, our options are, where, where do we stand in the, in the job market. Of course, you have to kind of go there and let's say test the waters. You have to jump in the water and kind of test it and see uh, where, you, where you stand in the, in the job market. Then uh, there is this question of when to go to the market, um, some some people uh, think that they should necessarily uh, wait for uh, uh, a publication before they go to the market. Uh, even if publications are important, we are going to talk about other ways that you can show your uh, research capability uh, if you don't have a publication. Um, then it's also a question of uh, what kind of positions and what kind of institutions uh, you can uh, you can apply for. So there are, uh, like I said, there are postdoc positions, there are permanent faculty positions, there are non-permanent faculty positions, there are lecture uh, positions, and so on. Um, some universities and some countries, they do have a tenure system. Uh, some universities do not have that. So these are different. And of course, the tier or the level of the university, you might want to uh, you know, apply somewhere that you have a reasonable chance. Um, so these are the things that uh, that we'll discuss today. And then we will talk about, of course, hard skills that you learn during the, the PhD program, but also soft skills that are very important throughout this uh, process, you know, communication and presentation and so on. We'll talk about different stages of the uh, selection procedure. Uh, then uh, something that is uh, becoming increasingly more important is uh, controlling online reputation. Uh, uh, many uh, PhD graduates or 
let's say, graduates in the job market that could be in the last year of their PhD, they have their own websites. If not, they have a LinkedIn profile and they uh, kind of manage their reputation because the idea is that they have to show themselves as an expert in something. So we are going to talk about that something that you have to uh, uh, kind of position yourself as an expert in. And of course, outlining a cover letter. Uh, I spent a lot of time myself with, uh, with cover letter and I talked to a lot of uh, senior friends that I had uh, in, in faculties across the globe. I sent them the cover letter. I asked them to give me comments and so on. So we are going to talk about the tone of the cover letter um, and the, uh, uh, the, the message that it should transmit in a uh, limited number of uh, words, actually. So to tell you a little bit about myself, um, some of my friends call me the nomad of academia because I, uh, I've been uh, around, I've been to uh, a lot of places. Uh, so my PhD, I uh, got it in 2016 uh, in business administration from Pablo de La Vida University in uh, Seville or Sevilla in south of Spain. Um, actually, before that, I had done an MBA in uh, Carlos III University in Madrid. Um, even my uh, uh, undergraduate studies, which was in engineering, was not in my home country. So I was in Romania for my undergraduate. Uh, I'm originally from Iran, so I just wrote the, 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 I just started from 2016 because I wanted to kind of go through the, uh, let's say, the path that I followed uh, uh, from that year until I ended up here in London. So at the same year that I graduated, I co-founded a small uh, consulting company called Personiol in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, that was with, uh, with another friend and it was about uh, consulting trade between uh, uh, so offering trade consulting to Spanish companies that they want to do businesses with uh, with Iran with my country so you can see that from the very beginning I was the kind of person that is interested in several things and I was not really uh, sure if uh, I, I just want to focus my mind on academic uh, career and I want to uh, follow with that so uh, I had, of course, a foot in, in, in academia always. So the next year I went to the US, to New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, I was an adjunct lecturer there. So uh, an adjunct lecturer is a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, non-permanent position. It could be for, for a year or, or it could be renewable or whatever. Uh, so you're not a faculty member and you are usually uh, hired on a temporary basis to teach uh, some courses. So I started teaching uh, undergraduate and MBA courses uh, in the US. Uh, if it, it, it was not, uh, for me, it was not a permanent plan, but it was a great uh, experience. I, I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to go back uh, to, to Europe and be uh, based in Europe. So the next year I came back to, to Europe, again, adjunct uh, in, in Madrid. And the same year I got another uh, offer from a private uh, business school in uh, Barcelona. So for half of the year, I was actually flying every week to, from Madrid to Barcelona, teaching one day, coming back. So like you can see here, a lot of uh, teaching. And then the rest of my time uh, was uh, for the project, the consulting project that I told you. But I still knew that research is, is important. So up to here, I was not in a, in a permanent uh, faculty position uh, because I wanted to, let's say, uh, give it a try with the with the consulting company, <clears throat> but um, 2019 turned out to be a turning point for me. So I realized that okay, now it's the moment that I tried uh, teaching and consulting and so on, and I know that I want to go to 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 the uh, to the to academia for a full time uh, position. So. I was like, okay, now it's it's a great time to go and uh, apply for uh, permanent positions. But wait a second, um, I do not have a lot of uh, publications because from my um, uh, PhD dissertation, I had only one publication, which took some years. Like you can see, I was spending time on, on other things. So it, it took some years to, for it to be published. So it was only 2019 that I had one publication and I was like, okay, so, 
what should I do now? So if I am applying for a position, I should say that I've been doing something in these three years after my, my PhD. So I found a visiting professor uh, position, which was again, uh, 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 not, uh, not a uh, permanent, a temporary position uh, back at home uh, in, in Iran, in Sharif University of Technology. And this was the first time I was doing both teaching, teaching and research. And I started working with uh, graduate students and I <clears throat> saw that actually with their help, I can do more, uh, more publications. And I found also uh, local colleagues to do uh, papers together. Uh, like you can uh, see from the timeline, there is something that hits the globe at that moment that changed our lives, let's say, and that was the pandemic. You know? So during this time, uh, the pandemic happened. And uh, even if I had uh, prepared everything uh, to show that I am active in research again and uh, to show some output and to uh, prepare my application for uh, job for the job market for the European job market again. I applied, but this time uh, I realized that the job market is very turbulent and it was not a good time. So that was, I think, uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, I was uh, getting uh, shortlisted, let's say, uh, um, only only once or twice I got shortlisted, and then it was really difficult to. Uh, to get an interview, I realized that there was a lot of change in the in the U.S. job market. A lot of the universities stopped hiring, so there were a lot of U.S. graduates also uh, coming for positions in Europe. So it was not a it was not a good time. And I was like, okay, maybe it's not uh, uh, the time for me to to look for a permanent position yet, uh, or a faculty position yet. So how about uh, I give it a try at a postdoc? And that's when I found this very interesting uh, postdoc uh, position at the University of Montpellier, which, by the way, also uh, yeah, was the uh, way that I got to know Asta and other uh, European uh, colleagues at this uh, digital health uh, platform. So my, my PhD was on uh, biopharma, was on technology alliances in the biopharma, then I had worked on healthcare. So I was interested in the healthcare and innovation in the healthcare anyway. And this project was about digital health platforms. So I was really, really uh, interested. Uh, so I got this position. I went to uh, Montpellier in South of France. Uh, and then I knew that, okay, so this is a, a two year, maximum two year uh, postdoc. Uh, but uh, by the end of the first year, I. Uh, I had applied for other positions, so I got my current position, uh, which is, uh, like I said, uh, a faculty position. Finally, that permanent faculty position that uh, uh, I think uh, every PhD graduate which looks for academic uh, job will, will want at, at some point. Uh, and then I came to London. So this was my story, and throughout this story, I learned uh, a couple of things that I want to uh, show with you. So uh, to job uh, to just look at the job market at a glance, things that maybe you you already know. Uh, you should uh, have already earned your PhD, or you should be close to comp uh, completion of a PhD. So that's usually uh, the uh, the last year of your uh, uh, your PhD studies. You can already start, uh, you know, being in the job market. Now we'll see what it means to be in the job market. Uh, uh, more often, you, uh, more often than not, you will need a job market paper, or you will need your your best chapter of your dissertation, or your one paper that you are uh, proud of and that you you might want to you, you want to enjoy actually presenting it, and you think that that's the best indicator of your research quality. So you call that your uh, job market paper, and then uh, you will uh, hope to get invited to uh, seminars. You know, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, present that paper. So you apply usually for as many positions as you can. Usually this is tens of positions. We are talking about uh, 30, 40, 50 positions. So I'm talking about uh, the example of not only myself, that for me it took a lot of years, but also for my friends that even in the last year of their PhD, they were determined that they do want an academic job. So they didn't have this Let's say, let me try these consulting things. Let's let me try that other thing, uh, like me. So they knew that they want to do this, and they had a successful, let's say, job market experience. But they uh, applied for like 
at least 40, 50 positions. So you should have, you should prepare yourself to uh, to do that. Then after that, uh, if you're lucky, you get uh, shortlisted or invited uh, to interviews. This could be uh, a campus visit that they invite you in person. Uh, sometimes it's called a flyout that they pay for your trip uh, to, to go to their campus, uh, to spend a whole day. Uh, sometimes, uh, like in my case, uh, it was not possible to, to attend it uh, in person. Uh, I needed a visa to go to the UK at that time, so uh, I did it online. Um, so it could be it could be uh, in a, in any form, but usually the campus visits are like very extensive uh, days. It could be like eight hour a day from morning to afternoon. You have interviews with different people, with the selection committee, with the head of the department or the school. Uh, then you present your research. So, it, it, like I said, it might include presenting your research. That is your uh, job market paper. It's different from, from one place to another. So some, some places might only have the interviews. Um, some other places might ask you to, uh, to teach a class. So they might actually say, okay, so here is a class that, uh, that we have, a, a group of students, and uh, choose a topic that you want to teach, and how about you come and teach it for us. So there are different ways that they can uh, structure your uh, campus visit. <clears throat> but of course, if it's an online, uh, uh, interview it's uh, it's usually shorter then uh, if you're lucky you get a job offer after the, getting the job offer there are negotiations uh, you can negotiate uh, not only the salary sometimes the the rank uh, more important you should uh, always uh, be careful about uh, the load of teaching that that they give you so uh, if there, there is a uh, teaching position, but there is also requirement for you to do research. If getting promoted depends on your research output, so then you, you don't want to be, let's say, bombarded with, with teaching. So you have, to, uh, you have to negotiate those things and say that you want teaching uh, research hours. This is, again, uh, something typical that uh, most uh, schools uh, get, uh, get you promoted uh, based on your research output so you want enough time to do uh, to do research uh, then uh, there there are some some things that you can you can uh, negotiate about your your benefits package and uh, so on and then you have a time to to accept or uh, reject the offer um, but this is what i put in red that by definition you will get several times more rejections than invitations so this is uh, just, it's, it's supposed to be there. I always uh, say to, uh, to myself, uh, when, when I got this, let's say, num uh, numerous rejections in the job market, I was like, okay, I should look at it as a, a market that there are like 100 PhD graduates and 100 positions. Uh, but because of this digital world, everybody is aware of the, the, the 100 positions. So everybody applies for, for 100 positions, but of course they eventually get only one of them. So it's okay to get rejected uh, one after the other because eventually there will be one, uh, uh, one position out there uh, for you. Um, to give you a number from, uh, from my friends that I told you they uh, did it right in the last year of their PhD. So they were um, right in the job market, uh, even uh, close to the completion of their PhD. They told me that they, they, they applied for like four, 40 or 50 uh, roughly uh, uh, positions. Uh, across Europe, and they got uh, shortlisted or, or interviewed for five, six, seven, around that number, then you can, so you can see that that all the rest is, is just rejections, right? And we're going to talk about rejections. Uh, then half of that numbers that you get interviews, you, you, might, get, uh, you might actually get uh, an offer. So you might, in the end, get an offer for one or two or three places. Uh, and uh, depends on your uh, on your package. So uh, if you want to to think about when to apply, of course you should apply when you're ready. But then there is a there is a uh, calendar for this that some universities, not all, mostly U.S. universities and some European universities, 
they start posting new vacancies in August for the positions to be filled either in January, in next January, or in next September. So you can think of a, like a 12 month uh, period uh, for them. But these are only some of them. Others run on a rolling basis throughout the year. So you can uh, expect to, uh, to find uh, positions posted across Europe throughout the year. So the position that I have now in, in the UK, it was posted in May, uh, May 2022. I had my interview in June and I got the offer in July. So it was just in a, let's say, two month period um, and it was done. Um, but something that I learned uh, myself, but quite late uh, was that I should apply early. Uh, some positions have a deadline. Uh, some positions might not uh, even uh, specify deadline. But I learned uh, that the selection committee might stop the search after they find the ideal candidate. So if you find a position that says that, OK, the deadline is like in two months from, from now, don't wait two months. Just apply. If, if you have your, your application ready, apply and uh, show interest. And, uh, and of course, you can always get in touch. Uh, apart from your formal application submission, you can get in touch with email and ask questions and Usually there is uh, one or two members of the selection committee that is there to answer your questions, you know, about the position and so on. So it's good to kind of engage in this uh, in this uh, conversation with them, and uh, uh, this it will this itself will take some time. Um, where to look for posted positions? You might already know some of these uh, uh, sources. Uh, I was mostly looking at Acadius, which is mainly for business and management. And uh, most of the positions are EU, but they're also from other parts of the world. Um, if you're interested in the UK job market, uh, they don't usually uh, post them on Acadeus, but they post them on their own uh, British website, jobs.ac.uk. Then of course you can use LinkedIn and you can uh, show your job searching prefer preferences so that you receive uh, job alerts. Uh, then there are other, uh, you know, uh, conferences and uh, uh, management associations that they have their own channels for uh, care, for uh, career services, actually. So the AOM, something that was uh, uh, very helpful for me was the mailing lists. So I am a member of the strategic management division and the team that is technology and innovation management divisions of the AOM. Uh, if I remember correctly, you can become a member even you can you can uh, subscribe to this mailing list even if you are not a member. So because being member member uh, means that you have to pay the, the membership. But from from what I remember, these were open to to the public. So you can find them and subscribe to them. Then they also have uh, career services, the AOM ones. Uh, traditionally, this was mainly focused on uh, US. Uh, universities, but now it's across the globe. So you can find uh, places in Asia and Europe and everywhere. And then the Academy of Management also uh, organizes virtual career fairs, which uh, for me, they were, they were quite uh, useful experiences of you know, talking to recruiters, talking to universities that they have positions and they're looking for uh, PhD candidates or fresh PhDs. And they come there to these uh, online events and it's like an exhibition and then you can go and book a time to talk to them. For me, the experience of talking uh, talking to these uh, people was uh, was good because eventually this is, I think, a skill that you have to cultivate to, uh, to of course, feel uh, confident talking about yourself and uh, prepare yourself for uh, interviews. Uh, EURAM, the European Academy of Management, also has a, a job market channel and they have a list of uh, a lot of job port academic job portals uh, in this address that I have uh, included. I'm going to share the slides with you in case uh, you find any of these uh, resources interesting. You can uh, you can try them. So once you find uh, a position, they they say that okay, so we are looking for a, a faculty member. Usually, it's an assistant professor for uh, for a fish for a, for a fresh. PhD, uh, you might want to think about a postdoc. Uh, if not, there might be also uh, lecturer positions. So when we say lecturer, apart from the UK, that uh, that the lecturer is a faculty member, uh, usually 
in other countries, a lecturer is a is a teacher a teaching position, so it's not a permanent uh, position unless it's uh, it's specifically stated. So uh, you might want to try uh, uh, different places and and look at the requirements. But uh, each of them, usually they, they, I mean, I haven't seen any place that they do not want your CV. So of course you should uh, uh, spend a uh, good time on uh, drafting your CV, uh, including a list of publications. Uh, you might not have a lot of publications, that's quite normal, but list of uh, uh, papers that are your, that you're working on. So your research portfolio, also classes that you have uh, taught. Uh, if during your PhD, you have taught classes, uh, that should go there. Uh, cover letter, which uh, we, we, are, we want to talk a little bit uh, more about it. Uh, uh, I think that uh, cover letter is, uh, uh, is is very important and it is worth spending time on it. Um, I tend to write extensively and I, I, I think I had the first uh, draft of my cover letter, three and a half pages. And I had started, you know, telling my story of what, what I did during my PhD, and then what I did in the US, and then what I did in Spain, and then the experiences in my classrooms, and then uh, working with my research co-authors, and so on and so forth. But it was it was too long. Uh, so I, I asked my my friends uh, to to read it. Uh, my friends that were faculty members, and they had been in, uh, let's say, uh, they had been there in the job market. The years before that, or some of them already were uh, sitting on uh, selection committees, on recruitment committees in their universities. So it was not only the length that I had to, to reduce, but also I had to kind of uh, think about the tone. Do I sound confident in this uh, cover letter? Do I uh, transmit this uh, message that I have some capabilities uh, in, in terms of doing research and in terms of teaching and then I'm uh, aware of them and that I want to develop them and uh, uh, how I can contribute to the programs of the, uh, the, the, the target university. So it's a good idea to kind of tailor your, your cover letter for every university that you are applying. So you should read the call or the, uh, the uh, job uh, ad carefully and see like what are the research positions that you are looking for, or if they are more teaching oriented school, uh, what is uh, what is it that they are looking for, and then kind of make a connection between those requirements and your background, you no, know, and then show that you can actually contribute to uh, to that school. Of course, this is a time consuming task because uh, we uh, we we talked about like applying for 40, 50 schools. So if you want to tailor uh, for each and every university, it will take some time. Sometimes you might uh, just try your, your luck and say, okay, this is my cover letter that I have it and I'm just sending it uh, the same the same uh, text. I'm sending it uh, over and over. But the more information you have from the uh, target university, the better. So you can kind of tailor your cover letter. Uh, so job market paper, uh, even if they don't call it a job market paper, that means even if the, there is no uh, presentation of your research uh, and the day when you get invited for the uh, for the interview, uh, there is uh, usually you know a screening of your uh, samples of research. So they want one or several. Sometimes they they specify it like two or three uh, samples of research. So of course uh, this should be papers that uh, that you have. Uh, worked on during your uh, your PhD. Uh, recommendation letters, uh, again, very different from, from one university to, to another. Uh, I applied for universities that wanted recommendations letters from the beginning. Uh, either I, I, I had them, they were open letters, I would attach them and send them, or they would uh, separately contact the, the referee that I had uh, like it was, my, it was my PhD supervisor or a senior colleague that I had worked with and so on. And they would receive an email with a link to a form that they had to fill in and, uh, and um, answer questions about myself. Some other places really didn't ask for recommendation letters. Uh, a lot of, uh, or I can say most universities in the UK, for example, they don't want recommendations letters until you are offered the job and you accept the, the, the position. Only then, while you are about to be recruited, they contact your uh, 
previous colleagues and they, they want that for the HR records. So it's not in the selection period that they want the, the selection process that they want the recommendations letters is only after that. Uh, so uh, my overall thinking is that recommendation letters usually do not play a pivotal role, do not make a big difference unless it's from someone that is a very strong link, that is a, someone that uh, you know has a um, very strong link with the university that you are applying for and can write a personalized a recommendation like uh, send an email and say that okay i've worked with this person i think this is a good candidate for you and so on unless uh, there is this personal uh, link that is a strong link uh, and that is your ref your referee um, i myself at least from my experience i don't think recommendation letters uh, were that crucial let's say then uh, if you have taught in the past uh, if you have taught classes and if you have teaching evaluations uh, they might uh, want them uh, want uh, you to attach them and send teaching evaluations that you got from your students. Usually, these are based on scores and um, numbers and so on. Um, sometimes they might ask for additional uh, uh, documents. Uh, some universities they they might ask for a research statement, which is uh, sometimes called a research portfolio. That is. Uh, uh, not only mentioning a list of your uh, uh, your uh, uh, research projects or ongoing papers, but also talk about your research plan and where are you going to go in the next, let's say, three to five years, and uh, what are your plans and what are the areas that you want to do research, and so on. So if a university asks for a research statement, this is a sign, again, that they are very research-oriented. So it's a good idea always to look at the uh, the, the department or the school website and to look at the faculty members there and to look at their research uh, 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 profiles and their publications and to see where you can make connections or where you stand uh, in comparison to them. Also for drafting the cover letter, uh, it's a great idea to look at the, uh, uh, the list of the faculty members in the target university and see if you can kind of make a connection. Uh, another document that uh, sell them, but sometimes uh, it was asked was a teaching statement or sometimes it was called a teaching philosophy. Sometimes it was more specific, like tell about your uh, approaches, talk about three innovative approaches that you would use in the classroom, like you would use, uh, I don't know, experiential uh, learning, or you would uh, use... Uh, um, case studies or you would use technology in the classroom and so on. But this was just uh, a minority of the cases, like very few cases that they ask uh, also for a teaching statement. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, research and showing uh, research capability that is uh, uh, obviously the most uh, sought after capability. So they want uh, to know that you have the potential to produce uh, research outputs. Uh, but if there are any questions or comments, because uh, I've been talking for like half an hour uh, by now, if there are any comments or questions at this moment, I can take a moment to, to listen. No? All right. So let's talk about, you know, showcasing your, your research uh, capability. So uh, like I said, uh, Usually you have a job market paper. Uh, even if not, in your cover letter, you should position yourself as an expert in something, right? So you have spent uh, at least four years of your PhD doing research in a very specific uh, field, right? On, on specific research questions. And that gives you an edge. So you are ahead of others uh, in that specific uh, area because you have done a lot of, uh, you have spent a lot of time and you have uh, invested a lot of efforts in, you know, learning the literature and knowing the, the, the state of the art and uh, perhaps going for publishing in that area. So you should kind of craft, you know, the, 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 uh, the expertise that you have. If you have first author papers, it, it, it is a great uh, help. Uh, even if uh, you're not the first author, but you have an R&R &R, that is a revise and resubmit from a uh, from a good uh, tier journal, that's really great. So that's that shows your research capability. That shows that you're almost there. So again, 
uh, the, uh, the universities are looking for potential. So a, a revise and resubmit is not a still uh, a, a publication, right? It's, just, it's, it's under review. So you're going to re revise it and, and resubmit it, but it shows your potential. Uh, and uh, that is uh, some usually enough for the target university to, uh, to know that you're capable of doing uh, quality research. Of course, for higher, uh, uh, academic uh, ranks like associate professors and so on, then this is not enough anymore. You have to have actually a solid list of publications that are out there. Um, so I talked about that being an expert in something. So uh, talking a little bit about uh, personal branding, uh, you should think about the first letters, the, the first words, sorry, that you want to write uh, in your bio on LinkedIn, or if you want to have a personal uh, web page, uh, uh, sometimes you can include it in your uh, in your CV header. So you, you should include the links anyway to, uh, to your LinkedIn and to your, to your website, but also you want to show what is your research interest or what is it that you are an expert in. So those keywords, let's say, are things that can uh, distinguish you. Uh, then again, if you don't have, uh, so you might not even have a paper in, in the RNR when you are uh, publishing for, when you are when you are applying for positions, but you should show your potential in other ways. So you should show that you have been to conferences, your work has been uh, accepted in conferences, uh, you, had, you, have, you have yourself reviewed for conferences. If you have had uh, visiting research stays, which are also a great way to uh, to do networking and to expand your uh, your networks in the job market. So you should uh, think of all the ways that can uh, reflect your research uh, capabilities. Uh, something that was very interesting for me, and again, it was it was like a moment of you know discovery for me, was that uh, even universities that are mainly teaching based, they uh, look for your research potential. Right? So this for me looked a little bit uh, 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 strange, but this is exactly what a professor that was uh, sitting on the selection committee of uh, a university told me that, yes, our positions are, are mostly teaching and we are hiring, uh, we are offering this position uh, because we want uh, people to come and teach, but to hire them, we look at their research uh, capability. And I thought that, okay, there is this always this, uh, pressure to publish because the universities want, uh, of course, uh, publications in their names and they want to uh, uh, go out, go up in the rankings and usually the publications help helps them to go up in the rankings and there is this competition between schools and so on. So uh, this is, this is, uh, this was just a moment for me that, okay, I realized uh, even if I am applying for, for teaching based uh, positions, and even if I like teaching so so good, and even if I have good teaching evaluations from the uh, places that I've been in the past, but that's not still enough, right? So I should still show that uh, I have uh, research capability. So of course, uh, for uh, for all of us, when we are uh, 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 during the PhD or fresh uh, PhD graduates, it's it's difficult to publish. So it's a skill that takes time to uh, to learn. So, uh, like I said, uh, another good uh, uh, advice that I received was uh, that uh, I, I can I can consider a postdoc, of course. Uh, so, considering a postdoc for me and going to Montpellier was a great uh, opportunity because I, I didn't have to teach anymore, so I had a lot of time uh, doing research and I didn't have any admin job. So, the the postdoc position was really really a great uh, uh, opportunity to spend uh, time only on, uh, on research. Uh, but an advice that I received before I was selected for that uh, postdoc was that uh, if you know uh, uh, scholars or uh, uh, like prominent scholars in other uh, universities that you can go and visit them and you want to work with them, see if you can self-fund uh, your visit, even if for a short time, uh, one month, even like somebody said, okay, even two weeks be better than nothing. No, so we can uh, we can sometimes do that because then you get uh, a, a, a connection working with a prominent scholar that is working in your field, 
and uh, you can maybe offer to work with them on a paper or something and then of course it uh, it builds uh, your your network further so this was a uh, this was an advice that i had uh, received then i talked about the postdoc opportunity uh, also uh, and uh, yeah so talking about postdocs i uh, came across this uh, comic uh, from phd comics which is uh, our way of uh, you know kind of soothing the the, the tough moments that we have uh, during the, the the job market or during struggling in academic job market so uh, this guy is telling to 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 his uh, colleague that actually being a postdoc is not that bad you don't have to write grants you don't have to worry about graduating you don't even have to teach so you will finally get to spend time on all the things that your uh, your training has prepared you to do and then the colleague says, oh, okay, research. The answer is no, applying for faculty jobs. So uh, it's actually true that uh, a lot of uh, programs, PhD programs do not specifically uh, train uh, uh, their, their uh, PhD candidates for you know, how to apply for, for faculty jobs. And I, I see that now you have these uh, series of talks, uh, trainings for young researchers that Asta is uh, is managing for you guys, and I think it's it's great. No, so it's it's one of the skills that are uh, that uh, that if uh, that you know, if you don't learn it like this, you will have to learn it. Let's say the hard way. You have to go to the market and then uh, make mistakes and eventually learn them. So it's always great to you know share experiences and uh, see where we can go from where we are. So. Uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about cover letter, just actually reviewing what I said, because I realized that cover letter uh, is uh, perhaps something that you can uh, do a lot of maneuver on. So the three important things are the CV, cover letter, and sample of research. Sample of research is there. Of course, you have done your best during your PhD. CV is also there. And of course, uh, we, we hear a lot about uh, CV and how to uh, craft it. But writing a cover letter that is a let's say two page document that uh, is that tells a let's say compelling story about you and your motivations and your capabilities uh, is your chance you know to get past that first barrier and to be invited for for an interview so i thought we have more maneuver let's say uh, 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 on the cover letter um, I, I, I thought that you should do your homework we should all do the homework and that was you know researching the the university that we are applying for, the position, the people that work there, the what, what they care about, the areas of research and teaching and so on. So uh, this is what I said, to read the call carefully and adapt your draft accordingly. Honestly, I did it maybe not for all of the places that I applied for, but maybe for, I don't know, a third of them that I could, uh, that I was more interested in, or I could spend uh, more time. For the rest, I just had, uh, uh, a draft and I was sending it out. No, so like we said, we are, we are applying for so many places. But if you can tailor your your cover letter, that uh, uh, that is a great uh, thing, you know, to be uh, catchy for the for the reader. Uh, then, of course, highlight your strengths, outline your plans. So you should show that you have plans for after joining the the university. Uh, you must sound confident and. Uh, this is something that I was that I was always asking, you know, my friends. Okay, can you re read my cover letter again? What do you think? Do I sound confident? Do I show my uh, capabilities? So uh, it shouldn't be really lengthy. Uh, I never uh, saw any uh, any limitation. Like in, in none of the jobs that uh, I, I applied for, they said, okay, a cover letter in maximum this number of pages. But of course, if uh, I mean, I learned that if, if it's too long, then they are just going to, to scan through it, you know, so it's important to uh, to shorten it. Now, after you write that compelling uh, cover letter, let's say, uh, that shows your interest and your motivation and your uh, and showcases your capabilities, then uh, hopefully you get invited for an interview. And I think this is the moment that, again, you as a human, you have more maneuver to do. So you have to prepare yourself for the for the interview, because uh, when you're invited for even an online or a per, a in person interview, you're not a bunch of PDL finds anymore. You're a human. 
you have feelings, uh, you can impress people, you can show that you have the capabilities that you claim, right? So it's important to be prepared for the interview and to uh, actually uh, 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 be able to make uh, a, a personal connection, uh, build a personal connection, let's say, with the people that you're talking to. So I, I thought, uh, and I learned actually, that it's always important to show interest in the school. So again, by doing that research about the school, uh, knowing uh, uh, what they are uh, focused on, where they have been, what are their plans, and so on, then you can uh, ask questions about the school. Also, the person you're talking to, if especially if it's a campus visit, you're going to talk to several people. Uh, so it's important to have a, let's say, fluent conversation with them. Uh, again, I'm, I'm repeating, doing that homework uh, beforehand, uh, which I repeated for the cover letter. So here, another, another round of doing that homework and investigating the people and the faculty members before uh, the interview. Uh, something that the recruiters want to see in their interview, apart from all that research capability and so on, is to see that you are you are a, a person that is cooperative, that is uh, you know able to uh, to uh, to work in a cooperative environment. They call this collegiality uh, characteristics that they want to see in you, right? So that is your uh, chance, let's say, to to show that. Um, I have a story here to to tell you. Actually, when I was in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, in New Jersey Institute of Technology, they were. Uh, they, they had opened a position in uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, which was my area. And then they had shortlisted uh, three candidates uh, from other American universities, other states that they wanted to come to New Jersey, the, the position, the, the location of the, the campus, and also the, the reputation of the school was quite good. So it was quite competitive. Uh, so there were three shortlisted uh, candidates, and I, I attended their job market seminars because for us it was just a seminar, research seminar, or a topic that we are we are interested in. Uh, one of them was a very strong person in terms of publication records and so on, but I could see that uh, he was not, uh, re let's say, ready to to accept negative uh, criticism of. Uh, his his work, you know, his research that he was presenting. So he got a bit, let's say, anxious when uh, one of the PhD students in the room asked him uh, a question that was maybe challenging and questioning his his methodology. And uh, he, he uh, in my opinion, he he answered it with a like kind of arrogant tone and saying that okay, you are a PhD student, you don't know these things, something like that. And I'm not saying it. Uh, upfront, but something like that, because he himself was already an assistant professor with some years of experience and uh, so on. So then because I was in that school and I was in uh, what it goes on, I, I realized that even if this candidate had a, let's say, better uh, research output in terms of publications in top tier management journals, but he was not eventually uh, selected. So another position, another uh, person was was selected and I made this conclusion for myself that okay, he didn't make a good impression as a person that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, easy to get on board with. You know, uh, another thing is uh, self confidence. I, I keep talking about that, but after self confidence, I put here humbleness. Uh, because that's a cultural thing, and I think there is a there's a balance we have to to find uh, to find out about that. Um, like uh, I'm uh, I'm from the uh, from the Middle East, and in most of the Eastern cultures, being humble and being modest is you know is a virtue. So it's good that when you are talking about yourself, you shouldn't sound too arrogant, and you shouldn't you know. Uh, 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 show as if you're, you're you're thinking too high of yourself and people appreciate that but the tricky thing is that in some other cultures think about the american culture uh you that, that might be a sign of you know lack of self-confidence so being being too humble might be interpreted as not having self-confidence so this is a let's say balance that you have to find uh in between uh i i also realized since i came to the to the uk that uh, the British culture also, you know, appreciates humbleness more than than the American culture, at least, right? So they, they might get it when you are saying that. Okay, I hope my presentation wasn't boring for you, you know. So this is this is something that you might hear in a 
uh, in, a, uh, in a British university and, and people appreciate it. But uh, I'm just saying this, that, that you have to, to kind of find, uh, find a balance and uh, make sure that you are not too humble in, you know, at the expense of not, uh, not sounding self-confident uh, enough. So that's knowing the, the target uh, audience that you are uh, talking to. Uh, talking about uh, lessons that I learned uh, during this, let's say, uh, job market uh, journey, something that I loved, that I learned was that uh, job allocation is not a linear uh, process. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, one candidate might get rejected from a lower tier school, but then get accepted in a higher tier one. So it's not that if you get, uh, if you have a certain uh, uh, resume and you get uh, rejected from this school, then you cannot really uh, go and apply for a higher uh, higher tier school. I have seen a lot of examples uh, myself. I have seen, I have been in touch with my friends who were in the job market and it has happened uh, for them. Uh, I had a friend who was, uh, when I was in France, he, he uh, turned to have, three very good uh, R&Rs. He, he was uh, graduating from a business school in, in Spain. And uh, he got uh, rejected from, a, let's say, tier two French school. But then the next week or two weeks after that, he got a job from a tier one French business school. And he was very happy. And of course, he he accepted that uh, that job. And I saw that this pattern is, is happening quite a lot. Uh, what are the reasons for that? One is that there should be a fit with the school. So it's not only that they look uh, very objectively at you know, the weight uh, or the heaviness of your research uh, portfolio or your research capability and say, okay, this is what you've done. So this is the number that we assign to you. So we get you. No, quite often they are looking for uh, people in a certain area or they are looking for uh, to, to kind of diversify their, their portfolio of, uh, of research, or they might also look for, you know, diversity in terms of background and, uh, 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 you know, demographics and so on. So there might be other reasons that are, uh, you know, that they do not have anything to do with your uh, research capability, but is a fit with, uh, with the school. And th there might be a reason that you get rejected, even if you have a good research quality. Another thing that is quite painful, but is unfortunately there, is that there are sometimes internal candidates that are uh, unofficially uh, selected for, for the position. Uh, and these are people from the same institution or people that uh, are known by the, by the recruiters. And they say that, okay, we want to hire you, but the regulations um, make us you know, to publish this uh, job uh, publicly and then accept applications and go through the selection process and eventually hire you, select you. So then this uh, unfortunately does exist. Uh, for me, I was like, okay, it's, it's a pity because we spend a lot of time on, on, on preparing our applications, but sometimes we're applying for a position that, you know, that it is unofficially already allocated to someone else and we are just applying. Of course, they never say it's out loud. They, they will say that, okay, we will evaluate the uh, the, the applications and they say eventually we evaluated this uh, person that we know as a better fit. And uh, sometimes also I, I learned that the position might be cancelled. So in, in my case, I, I was interested in uh, another uh, British university and I went through the uh, 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 selection process with them. I spent a lot of time, all those things that I told you, you know, tailoring the cover letter, uh, going through the, the informal talks, uh, emails, even I, I went through a, a meeting with, uh, with them before applying. Sometimes they offer this, let's say, quick online chats and so on. And uh, despite all the, uh, the amount of time that I had spent, uh, I, I saw that I was not selected. And then I, I heard from another colleague in that institution that eventually no one was selected for that position because of whatever internal arrangements that they had in the school and the position was uh, was canceled. So uh, the, the, let's say the moral of the story is that don't lose hope along the way. Like I said, rejection is just part of the story. It's gonna be there uh, and we all get more rejections than, than acceptances. So it's pretty normal to, uh, to get rejections and we should uh, be prepared for that. So I learned that 
in order to get rejections over and over and not to, to get disappointed, you should cultivate this quality, what is called perseverance. And I like this, uh, this dictionary uh, definition of it, persistence in doing something dis despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And I like this, this part of delay in achieving success because eventually success will come in, in, the, in the job market, but sometimes it comes late, you know? So you really have to, to uh, uh, you know, just be persistent and push and uh, there, there are moments of despair, of course, but then you, you should build your, your spirits up, uh, uh, high, high again and go back to, to applying uh, because that's uh, what it takes to, to succeed in the job market, to have uh, perseverance. Uh, it's a long process usually and uh, you need to be uh, ready for it. So after you do the interview and uh, you... Uh, uh, go through everything that we said, you might uh, hopefully get a, a job offer. Uh, at this moment, uh, I think it's important that you know about the tenure systems in different countries, um, like uh, just to name countries like uh, Spain or Netherlands, they have tenure systems uh, similar to the US. Uh, sometimes the uh, even if the, sim the system is similar is that in the, in the sense that you are um, uh, you are uh, hired not permanently, but for like five to seven years or something like that. And then you must show a certain level of um, um, quality in uh, research and teaching and so on to, to be promoted to a tenured position. So in some uh, uh, countries or in some schools, it is tougher and in others are easier. So these are the things that you should, let's say, do your uh, your. Um, uh, and research on some countries like France, public schools in France, not the private ones, uh, like the UK, they do not have a tenure system. So they offer you a permanent position from the beginning. Uh, usually they come with a, with a probation period, but probation is very easier than, uh, than uh, tenure. So you just get one, two, three years maximum of a, of a probation. And just during the probation, if everything goes fine, which is uh, normally it does go fine, go go uh, okay. Then you get um, to the permanent phase of your contract. So again, negotiating salary and rank and uh, research hours. Also, I, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, these are the things that you can do when you uh, are offered a job uh, offer and you can uh, negotiate. It also shows uh, confidence. Uh, then you can take time to evaluate your options. Sometimes the university tells you that, okay, we, we want uh, to offer you this job offer, but then you can ask them time to think about it. You might want to wait to hear from another school that uh, you might be more interested in, or it's located in a place that you want more or whatever. So you want to see your, uh, your other options so you can take time to evaluate them. So this is uh, the end of my, uh, my talk before I uh, go on this hands-on activity, which I thought is uh, it's not a bad idea to kind of draft your uh, uh, cover letter for uh, a position in uh, Acadeus. So if you uh, click on this, uh, you get to the main page of the announcements in, uh, in Acadeus. And I thought, uh, so we have uh, enough time now to do uh, this, to spend some time thinking about any of the positions that you see here. Uh, I can I can put the link in the chat, uh, and then we spend some time. Uh, you spend some time thinking about you know maybe four or five bullet points that you want to write in your uh, in your uh, cover letter. Uh, like I said, I think the cover letter is is, is something that we have uh, let's say more control on thinking about CV, cover letter, and research sample. Cover letter is the the one that we can uh, you know change things. Uh, in it and spend more time. Uh, but I'm open to, to other suggestions as well. So this is one mm -hmm. exercise we can do uh, to, to think about uh, cover letters, but we also have time for discussion or anything else. Yeah. Asta, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, it's time for discussion. We have uh, like uh, half an hour and uh, I believe it's an excellent opportunity for uh, PhD studies to, to ask questions and, and discuss uh, an actually excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, 
it, it gave a very realistic way how to handle your um, academic career in general and actually that you can any of you can do that international um, promising career as, as a young researcher actually so uh, let, let's have a discussion okay and share our our own experiences uh, together what career path other PhD students are thinking about what are the most difficult uh, parts of it okay and um, and of course most of you are like first year, but uh, we know that uh, whatever by design is always better than uh, uh, ad hoc planning, right? So career by design is uh, much more promising, sustainable, and um, I don't say that there will be less uh, hurdles on the way, okay? Because uh, as always, I mean, uh, you have to, to be, actually, I really like that word, uh, could you could you remind me persistent uh, perseverance perseverance yeah. right so it's it's excellent word I put for myself uh, uh, so, yeah. so, so you will encounter right, a, a number of of uh, obstacles that you have to overcome so le let's let's uh, let's have a discussion okay let's share um, our ideas on on career. At, uh, and and ask questions, Saleh, because he's excellent in in, in building his own career. Um, I can Juan? see one, yeah. Thank you, Saleh, for this uh, great great presentation. Uh, really, that in, inspiring for for roll out all the work that you have doing and how to to do the same example. I have two questions. Um, the first one. Uh, you talk about uh, the nomad of academia, yes? And please, uh, you and Professor Asta, please l let us know what do you think about the value of worldwide uh, knowledge, yes? The, the fact to be in different countries and to understand or to live different environments versus the requirement of the market of deep local knowledge when you want to apply to a position. Uh, what do you think about that? And after that, I make the, the second question. Okay, Asta, would you want to go first? Um, well, let me think a bit, okay? <laughs> so maybe you can go first. Okay, so yeah, it, it's great to, to see you, uh, Juan. So uh, yeah, so that thing about nomad of academia, actually my friend uh, once called me a tourist of academia and I thought, okay, more than tourist, I'm like a nomad that has an academic product, you know, like say this is research and teaching and I go place to place and say, hey, do you buy this from me? Do you buy this from me? You know, so that's like uh, uh, what it, uh, where, where it came from. So uh, I think one, one good thing with being uh, in so many places is uh, that you, uh, learn, of course, these soft skills. Uh, you learn to, to you know, you learn to know about different cultures. You learn to know different, uh, you know, requirements of, you know, uh, how how places are different. So it's just different experiences that they add up to your social learning. Uh, let's say they are enriching uh, anyway. But it's also important what you said as like uh, showing that you have an anchor that you're deep, deeply focused on something. So that I think uh, does not necessarily have to be local, like geographically local, but it has to be like uh, uh, deep knowledge in, in, in one area, you know? So uh, uh, as long as you have a good network and as long as you're, you, you're uh, able to build networks so that uh, you find out about what's happening in the US, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in the France in terms of job market, you know? Uh, and then you also show that you're you have expertise in some specific uh, uh, field or area. Then, of course, that, then I think that that makes a good uh, good combination. You know, so you uh, you you learn a lot of things by being uh, around. And of course, business schools are the places for diversity, promoting diversity and promoting internationalization. So usually they perceive it as a good like, as a good sign. You know that okay, you've been to. Uh, to so many places, but of course, uh, one thing that that I, I had to 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 uh, to take care of in my uh, in my cover letter was to explain why I didn't stay in one place for so long, right? So why did I move from here to there? 
right? So I had to show it because it could, this could also be uh, like, like a challenge instead of an opportunity. This could be that, okay, so what's wrong with this person that is going from one place to another, right? So you had to, to kind of showcase that as a, as a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, I, I think Select covered the major part that, that really counts, uh, especially that science is international, so there is no national or local science, right? Uh, and in that sense, uh, you should understand the language, right? Uh, I remember that um, I started to do research on dynamic capabilities. But I really understood what does it mean dynamic capabilities when I went to ES and really saw what does it mean dynamic markets. So until then, I couldn't, I, I, I understood what, what I was reading, right? But to really have a notion, uh, the, the deep understanding of the concepts that, that are popular, uh, I understood only after being in the environment uh, that, uh, that really produced dynamic capabilities as a concept. So, so this, is, this is very important for uh, maturing uh, knowledge and expertise in general in the field. Um, networks, Salih already mentioned that if you want really to be part of the communities and journals, conferences, whatever activities, communities, right? So being part of the communities, you need to, to be part of them at, at, at certain points. So you need to, to, to travel. And also uh, these days, students are international. So to know more or less cultures uh, that uh, your students represent, it's, it's important because then you understand uh, what they're living with um, in general or their mindset a bit. So, so I would say that uh, under these conditions that we have uh, internationalization conditions, international science, um, it, it, international experience uh, is, is, is really a uh, utility that you should have. Of course, you should know local market as well, especially if you are in a big country, because in the big country, um, you know, um, the market is big. If you are in a small country, so that the local, local market is very small, right? So, so um, it's not a big deal to, to know it. So it's it's more or less my my notion at present. Thank you. I don't know if someone have a question, uh, but if not, I have my second question. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Thank you. Can okay, you please uh, please go go, Nisar. Yeah. Okay. My, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, especially it's very practical knowledge based uh, presentation so you explained very well so i have a uh, one question about uh, you explained about academia career after phd for phd um, candidates they have very narrow career they have just like uh, they can be like as a teacher postdoc or maybe some research work so if someone, they want to pursue their career in industry or maybe manufacturing or consultation like this, so how he can be fit or transfer to in industry? So please elaborate this because um, nobody wants always in research. It's also very uh, hectic career. So right. kindly, please, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I will say what I uh, what I think, and then I, I I would also love to hear about uh, hear from Asta about uh, what what he thinks she thinks about this. So one problem with doing a PhD and then going for an industry job is that uh, you might be regarded as overqualified, right? For a lot of jobs, you're overqualified with uh, with a PhD because they would say, okay, I would. Uh, need a master's, a person with a master's degree uh, that is uh, younger and didn't spend uh, four years of life doing uh, uh, research that uh, is so specific in, in one theoretical uh, field or in, in one area that uh, I, I don't really need it at this uh, industry job. But there are also, there are still uh, a group of industry jobs that require uh, the kind of skills that you that you develop during the uh, the PhD. So those can be uh, 
uh, like for us in social sciences could be things like uh, uh, quantitative methods, uh, econometrics, uh, data sciences, uh, things like that, you know, for, for those that, that do quantitative job, they might go and they, they might just say, I'm, I'm capable of working with, with uh, data. Uh, during my PhD, I, I did it for a whole different thing, but now working for your corporation, I might be doing it for, for your uh, problem, let's say. So working with, uh, with that. Another uh, uh, area, let's say another possibility is that uh, you might want to get into uh, to university just to have uh, a, let's say, part-time position and then have uh, still one feet in, uh, in the industry with a kind of consulting, especially because we are in the business uh, area and business schools. So uh, I know positions that are like professor of practice, right? So professors of practice, uh, do not really do uh, research in the traditional sense that we do to publish in journals, but they uh, have this kind of uh, uh, contact with businesses uh, that they are part of the uh, university curriculum, let's say, that they have to uh, you know, get in touch with, uh, with businesses, uh, find out about their, their problems, their challenges, uh, things that they are facing, and then offer them uh, solutions. So you kind of take the, the, the problem that you want to study from the business. Uh, and that's, that is not going to be uh, necessarily a research paper, but it's going to be a project for, uh, that, that you do for the, uh, for the business. In, in, the, in, the, in the UK, for example, there is this KTP, they call it the knowledge transfer protocols. And the KTPs are, uh, are just this, no? that there are uh, links between university and industry. And you do this for a couple of years and maybe you build your network in, in the industry and then eventually you can uh, you can go for uh, for an for an industry for a, for a, for an industry full time industry job. Uh, that is something that I was uh, also uh, kind of um, doubting with. No, I was thinking about uh, the beginning of my uh, uh, so right after the finishing of my PhD for three years after 2016, I had this consulting job. But of course, I found the answer that no, I want to come to this side of staying in, uh, in academia. Um, so yeah, uh, I think these are, these are some, some, uh, some just thoughts to, 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 to share about industry jobs, but it's, it's never easy, I, 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 would, I would imagine. Uh, Asta, what do you think about this? Yeah, actually, I have experience from other side. Uh, so I, I had quite a number of PhDs coming from, uh, from, from business. And usually, I was, when I was talking with them, I was saying that you don't need PhD. I don't know why you're getting here just to spoil your, your life. You're, now you have a very calm life. When you get to academia, uh, you shift your brains, you know, and uh, you get, <laughs> you become a restless person because your mind is always overheating from different thoughts that you don't need, actually. So in that sense, um, I don't know why business people like sometimes to have PhD, um, sometimes because their family had PhD, uh, sometimes uh, other purposes, but one purpose is that I really think that is valid. Um, to address high skills areas so uh, i don't think that uh, there is an issue you know to to get a job in industry to address uh, high skill jobs like uh, data science uh, like uh, even human uh, uh, human resource management because uh, if you see the selection process today uh, in the big companies it's it's very automized and and ie driven in general right so so even uh, for social sciences and humanities, there are jobs that require uh, higher analytical or high analytical skills, right? So, so for these jobs, they are looking for PhDs to, to apply this. Uh, otherwise, if you go to some uh, uh, really practical job that does not require uh, those high analytical skills, I, I think a PhD is redundant for both sides. For 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 a person that gets bored working very simple work, um, I was applying to 
human resource manager position uh, before 20 years, 20 years ago. Um, and I got the place and they said like, uh, okay, so now your job is to organize conferences and to organize workshops. I said, oh my God, I was doing that when I was 18. So I will die in, in this kind of uh, activities. Even the salary was nice, right? So, so um, I was, uh, uh, then, then I took the decision that probably I am already I uh, have shifted mind and I need academia because I cannot uh, stop um, thinking in general as, as a general habit after PhD. So um, I hope I answered uh, to your question, but, but in general, uh, you have to, to match the job with a with high uh, competence and you should not stay in academia if, if you like uh, um, regular jobs in that sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe I can add uh, just uh, one <laughs> sentence because uh, uh, I mean, both of you, Salah and Anastra, are uh, from academia. So uh, it's probably uh, what I want to say that there are research positions in the industry itself, which is called researchers. So maybe the differences between the topics and between the, again, maybe salary in some cases and uh, yeah, so I don't know, like, uh, I would say that it's important to understand what do you want to do, because probably in, in academia, you can switch the topics more easy, easier than uh, in, in, in the industry, because if you work in the pharmaceutical company, right, in the PhD, in, and you have PhD and you have some kind of knowledge, it would be hard to, you know, switch to, to another topic in, in the same area. But if you are working in a university, I guess you can do some extra, you know, project work, whatever, whatever on the side. And uh, uh, maybe from, uh, I don't know, microbiology switch to the chemical uh, engineering or something. No, it's not, it, it's not easy to shift from uh, no, no, it's, it's not area easy. to area. But like, but but maybe even yours example, uh, Asta, uh, Professor Asta, because uh, if I remember correctly, you have a PhD in psychology, right? And but you are not working in psychology at all. So well, in some sense, right? So you switched, <laughs> and uh, probably in the industry, if you would work, I don't know, twenty years in the as a researcher, psychologist, psychologist in the I don't know clinics or somewhere else. Uh, it wouldn't be so easy to you, you see so. i would say that it depends because first of all engineering and uh, natural sciences are more difficult to shift it requires more time uh, and to shift from technological sciences and the natural sciences to social sciences is easier uh, because i started my education in medical sciences by the way uh, and then it's ecology and then it's educational sciences, management. So, so, and I would say that the transition takes like five to seven years. So it's not like shifting, it's learning. It's continuous learning of new things. And it's, it's a sandwich, you know, when, when you have one layer, one layer, one layer. Um, and it's the same in industry. Of course, um, in industry, it's more difficult because you have to perform a very um, clear task. So you don't have, too much time for investing in learning, but even if you do that, right? So in your PhD, you invest in learning after your regular hours, or even if it's flexible, so you use some kind of flexible arrangements to, to, to work on learning. But if you invest in learning, you can switch in any area in general. But uh, on the regular basis, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to change between uh, even social sciences like management, economics, or psychology, because everywhere it's their own vocabulary. So you need to learn language, first of all, right? And uh, on my own uh, experience, um, <laughs> now I have uh, really a sandwich that helps me in, in the topics I'm working, digital healthcare management, including psychological skills, you know, uh, of individuals that uh, react to technical systems. Hmm? I think we can talk about like kind of sticky and non-sticky uh, knowledge areas, no? So what uh, uh, Yulia uh, mentioned was like this life sciences, for the example of life, life sciences was the sticky ones, no? That you, you, you are trained because you are working in that knowledge area. But I'm, I'm thinking of like friends that I had in the US that uh, were graduate uh, from a PhD in, uh, in economics. 
and he was working in a biotechnology company in a biotechnology startup. You might wonder why, why should they uh, hire an economist? Well, of course, data sciences, right? So all what, what he was doing was data sciences. He didn't know anything about biotechnology and he didn't need to know. Or I have friends that are that they have PhD in physics and they are working in, in investment banking, of course, uh, mathematical modeling, right? Again, data sciences, things like that. So those, let's say, skills are not very sticky and are transferable from from one area to to another. But some other areas, uh, uh, it's not it's not uh, easy to switch. Just like uh, Asta mentioned, yeah. Yeah, any other questions, worries? What, what are your closest worries to, to, to career management? Uh, Juan, you had another question. I didn't, no, I didn't no, it had, has been answered with uh, the discussion. Oh, really? Yes, Thank yes, you. yes. Uh, just a comment. Um, maybe two of you know in my, my career, and I feel that it's possible to make this mix because Today, just an example, my former chief, the CEO of the company that I come, uh, has been a PhD. And we understand how, and now I start, start to understand how he applied his knowledge from PhD to the industry, to the market. Um, it's not easy, but I think that is possible. Uh, today, the the CEO the CEO of Samsonite in India is also a, a PhD. Some uh, people in uh, Google or some company like this are PhD. So I, I think that there are uh, a high uh, mountain to climb out, especially because I think that really, as you say, uh, Salim, there is to be considered overqualified. Uh, that will came all time, yes? So how to balance that? And uh, today, I think that the market, uh, the HR market demand people that have multiple uh, skills that could move to the technical, to the data, to the commercial, to the human, and, uh, and, the, and the social intelligence that you, you, could, that you must have to, to, to have a team to have a team to recognize as a leader and how to, to get all this, this information to the market. So that, that's uh, the comment that I have, but I, I am agree with all the comments that uh, Professor Astam you have said. Yeah. Okay, Davila, are you with us? It's just interesting because you joined the, on the topic, it's, it's not your part of the course, so. I was just wondering uh, if the villa had some kind of uh, uh, motives to join career management. Had you had some ideas why you joined the career management uh, topic or maybe some questions or? Uh, hello. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for nice discussion and presentation. Uh, and uh, <laughs> now I'm, I'm in maternity leave, so <laughs> in my hands I <laughs> I I mm. take my 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 daughter, but uh, but I am uh, how to say I'm going to switch my path uh, again into academy because uh, I feel that it's uh, the time is coming <laughs> when I when I will be prepared. For it, uh, just of uh, of 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 all uh, diff how to say uh, different uh, events in life. So 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 I feel that I'm going to uh, make my how to say decisions again on my PhD on my uh, academia path, and. Uh, uh, I had uh, experience in uh, industry because I worked uh, 10, 10, 10 years in, in the bank. So I I came from uh, I came from industry to academia, and uh, at first I have to admit that for me it was very difficult to adapt because it's, it was very uh, different environment, different requirements, and. Uh, and that uh, 
that career path uh, uh, was a challenge for me in academia because I have a lot of doubts about uh, uh, my ability to, <laughs> to achieve something in academia. So I have to, I have to spend uh, some time to, to think about my goals, my, my skills, my ability to adapt my skills from, from, uh, from industry, from the market. So, 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 so when I, uh, it was, it was interesting for me to, to, to hear all, all this presentation. And now I have to, uh, let's see, uh, maybe now I'm going to, uh, to make my plan, <laughs> how to return, how to return successfully and rapidly into my PhD uh, how to say final uh, battle <laughs> <laughs> but as uh, having experience to compare between industry and academia um, you asked first of all why you went to academia and then uh, uh, do you still feel motivated to stay in academia in comparison to, to industry uh, yes, uh, I feel motivated to stay in academia and first of all I think it's uh, for me, it is uh, how to say to uh, maybe I feel curiosity uh, to find different concepts, to find something new, to to uh, uh, maybe not to uh, I, I I maybe I can say that I don't don't want to live uh, how to say quiet and calm life and and have all difficulties, but uh, but I think that academia gives that chance to uh, I know to seek all the time, to be curious, to to find something new, to mm. to adapt it, to check it. Uh, I don't know, try again fail and also try again and uh, and uh, do not uh, uh, I know stay calm maybe yeah. so you're attracted uh, to dynamic and uh, not easy life right <laughs> yes <laughs> okay so um, do we have any other questions comments uh, it's a good uh, opportunity to ask Saleh a last question um, yeah. So if not, uh, uh, again, thank you, Saleh, for taking uh, your time to, to present and share your experience. Uh, um, I believe all my colleagues uh, will really benefit from the knowledge they got today. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, Saleh, we keep in touch and, and we are uh, back with PhD students next week, I believe, right? Still, I hope everything is fine with Zaman and, and, and you will send me some work. Right, Zaman? Oh, anyway, we'll okay. communicate in the Just my chance to say thank you to everybody. It was a pleasure being with you. Uh, it was nice talking about this. So we are all learning in this, uh, let's say, journey that we call it, I think, uh, Tavil, uh, what's, what's the name? No, she, she mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe one good uh, way to describe people that they do want to stay in academia, despite all these, you know, ups and downs that we talked about in this journey. So I hope everyone will have an interesting journey. Uh, and yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And please remember to share that link, which you mentioned for co letter. Okay. Sure, sure. I will, I will yeah, share the, yeah. the slides. Is that okay? Yeah. I share the slides with you, Asta? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. I will then send to, to PhD students. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. thanks a lot and uh, have a nice weekend for all of you. Professor, Thank can you. I ask you to stay for a few minutes? Yeah, I'm sorry for all of you. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. Zali. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a nice, a nice weekend. Uh, professor, can I also ask you something? Yes, just the question is how we organize that. <laughs> is uh, it, uh, Julia, is it something that uh, we talk uh, two of us? 
Uh, yeah, it's a, a little so, so maybe Adla, you can join in 10 minutes. The same or, or I can go out. With, it would uh, be beneficial for all of us. Yulia, uh, we talked about this. I wanted to ask oh, about okay. the final assignment mm -hmm. about the uh, case study extended abstract, mm -hmm. just to clarify a little bit about the task, because it seems that we should start working on it maybe already now. So just a little clarification, what is expected from us? Yeah. So first of all, I provided uh, the structure in the slides. Uh, however, as I said before, it's about a small paper based on a couple of uh, cases, right? So I believe that it would be most easier for you to take uh, the systemic literature review, to take critical review, right? Like a theoretical background to work out certain theoretical model. Again, everything is a small scale. So, so don't try to uh, do your PhD thesis, right? So you can take very small and specific research question for this exercise. However, uh, anyway, you have to support with literature analysis. Again, very um, short and concise. Starting with research question, aim, objectives, right? Uh, everything that, that is valid for all that kind of activities, uh, concept definition, theories, methodology, so methodology is case study. Um, and then, and you know that there are a number of, of case studies, methodologies in itself, results, discussion, conclusions, theoretical, practical contribution, um, limitations. So, so the structure is provided in the slides, but also it's a classical paper structure, of course, references. Um, however, it shouldn't be long. It's maximum seven pages, so it's maximum seven pages. It can be five pages, right? So, so everything is concise but clear, right? Concerning um, case studies itself, right? So as I said last time, it could be one interview, can be two interviews, but as you know, case studies is not only interviews. So it's a triangulation of uh, diverse data collected uh, from secondary sources, collected it might be collected by survey, by, by interview, by focus group. Uh, so it's, it's primary and secondary data to coming together, right? And it's best that you see a couple of examples in the papers, in the database you already know, right? In, in the work science, you can take journal as can for case studies papers and, and see how it's done. Um, and that's it, right? So have I answered your question or still you would like me to, to add something? Maybe can I ask in another way? So are, do I understand correctly that we have to, uh, again, read some articles, uh, probably new articles, select maybe one uh, and com do something here and compare results. Uh, but here, I mean, something similar to what was done? Or no. Not? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, have you ever heard about case studies as a, as methodology? Yes. Mm -hmm. So any empirical research is based, uh, first of all, it can come inductive or deductive way, right? So if you come deductive way, you do data collection and you develop theory from the empirical data you receive. If you do deductive, uh, you start with a theoretical analysis, but as I say, you can use the theoretical analysis you made already. So not doing new papers, but really uh, posing the research question based on the literature you have. But here you add case study research methodology, first of all, data, data analysis, providing results and discussion parts. So, this exercise is not so much about literature review, of course it is needed, but it's about empirical part. Yeah, well, uh, maybe I did formally correctly. What I wanted to ask, so we have to compare those. Is, I mean, we can't take out of a blue a case study about something. We have to find uh, like an article to which we could compare our results or no? Because, well, I mean, yes and no, because 
have you ever tried to write a paper? So how you was doing that? Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the review of the lit literature review and then some experiments and then the results and comparing those results to the, to the other exactly. works. Exactly. Yes, but I, I never worked with the case study, so that's why maybe I, I don't understand. So the case study well is the, the, the difference from the process you described. Case studies is qualitative data. Okay, so if you have quantitative data, you have sheets of Excel, you do regression analysis or correlations, and anyway, you compare what you received with other results uh, because you have to somehow position your results in, in, the, in the field, right? With the qualitative data, what is different is uh, analysis. It's, it's analysis of the data because you have to code it, right? And you are not working with numbers in majority, but you are working with a coded text. So this part probably is, is, is the most different, but otherwise it's the same. You work with the literature, you produce theoretical model. Based on that model, you collect data, uh, you code the data, you know, and you somehow reflect how the, the results relates with your model. And then you reflect how your results uh, reflect with the previous literature right just the thing is that normally it's a big work to do what i say please think about very uh, small research question or, or narrow research question that would not expand the scope of your literature analysis uh, theoretical model or something else right i was just thinking maybe we can devote one of the consultations to discuss what is case study methodology. I think uh, it would be better for you, right? You haven't uh, discussed with Janetta. We had, but like in a very brief manner, just uh, like a two slides. Uh, ah, okay. So let's see the dates. Second, second of June. Just a minute, I will check second of June if we can do case study methodology. Uh, we have 7th of June, All right? It's, it's not next week that we have, but we have week after next. Okay. So uh, what we can do, we can do on 8th, we have Nina, right? June 8th. Yes, we have June 8th, it's Thursday, and we have uh, Nina uh, Helen, the presentation of time management, and then we have consultations, right? So let's devote uh, the consultation part for case study methodology. So I will, I will provide the case study methodology uh, that you can use, and we can go like step by step through the assignment for, for you to, to better understand uh, this exercise. Okay. I will write an email on that, but, uh, but in general, we agreed and, and then you can uh, proceed, but it would be good that you would have for the 8th of June, um, some kind of research question. Okay. So you can take your thesis research question, but think about specific area. Okay, so, so derive the specific research question from your uh, thesis question. And then we can, we can test this very specific uh, research question with the case studies. Okay. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So, Nasara, you, you had a specific question or? No, um, we have a class uh, after half hour or not. No, yes. we have consultation, but as nobody assigned for consultation, so we have okay, okay. half so, consultations. No, okay. no, no. So, no I, I haven't any question because yesterday we already discussed. So, okay, Professor, 
Thank you. Yeah, I will write an email. I talked to the PhD school, so I will write an email with the CC to you, uh, and you will see the, the issues there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, have a good weekend. Bye bye. Goodbye. So I'm leaving now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Uh, Zaman, do you have okay? <laughs> no, like, no, no, no question. Uh, žinau, kad nesamu, nesu modelius susijęs klausimas, bet iš kartų prireikia laisi labiau apie bendrai doktorantūrą ir principus, nes um, nu, čia šiek tiek taip gaunasi, kad um, aš greičiausiai keisiu darbą <laughs> ir keisiu darbą taip, kad nu, irgi su gyvybės mokslais, ta prasme, viskas ten tas pats, su, nu, net saks, bet su gyvybės mokslais ir sistema ir bendrai toks research darbas inovacijų agentūrų ir taip toliau. Ir aš mm. tiesiog kaip galvojau, kad būtų labai įdomu man ir PhD savo daryti tos, nes man reikės iš esmės vertinti jako sistemą, kurti jos augimą, žodžiu, nu, progno, prognozuoti priemonės ir taip toliau panašiai. Ir man tai atrodo labai reikia galėtų būti kaip ir nu, tyrimynė dalis. Ir mano tiesiog klausimas, ar, ar tai yra iš vis įmanoma keisti po metų tį, kaip ir aišku. ir tai ir grupė ir, ir man daug labai klausimų tada kyla, nes nu čia visiškai nesu žmogiškų kaisis išteklės tada gaunasi. Ir aš net nežinau, čia vadyba lieka, ar čia jau eina kažkoks kitas kaip nu, jo, matai, čia yra niuansas. Keisti temą tu gali visada. Jo. Ja. Ir vadovą keisti, mhm. nes visa grupė ir visa kita, ką tu kalbi, tai yra vadovas. Ja. Ten kur vadovas ten doktorantas, ar ne? Taip. Čia yra trikišius. Tu gali tą daryt, mhm. bet reikia, nu kaip pasakyti, sutart su vadovu taip, kad vadovas neįžeidžiant vadovu, grupiai sakant, ar ne, ir aišku, reikia susirast naują vadovą, ja. <laughs> kuris priimtų tematiškai, bet klausimas ar tikrai ta tavo tema tiek radikaliai keičiasi, kad keistum vadovą, Mhm. Ar tu tiesiog tema keiti, nes tema keis tai sustari su vadovu ir keiti. O kad tu vadovas pirmyt, man truput? Um, Savanevičiai, ne, Aha. Aš, aš dar nekalbėjau, nes iš pradžių tiesiog norėjau suimti su doktorantūros, ja, kaip, 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 kaip komiteto pirmininkė, aš nekalbėjau, aš iš įmanoma, ar čia kaip tokie dalykai. Įmanoma, ir žino, kas tai nu, yra tikrai labai plačios patirties. Mhm. Ta prasme, kad jinai įma pakankamai giliai, nu, ir, ir, ir plačiai ir giliai jo, jo. tas tematikas, ir, ir jeigu tu jai išaiškinsi, ką, ką, ką tu nori, nu, pakankamai yra šitoje srityje ir patyrus vadovė, ir, ir kompetencijos plačios. Ta prasme, man tai kaip vadovė puikiai įtinka, ir man labai viskas, ta prasme, patinka ir visą kitą, aš tiesiog, nu, vat, nu, nežinau, ar, ar gali, va, taip iš viso, kaip Tema, sakai. tai absoliučiai čia tiesiog ateisi atestacija su kita tema ir tiek. Nu, nu, dar nežinau, ar iš šitą stėkriau, čia reikėtų daug dar visko pergalvo, bet... Nes tai nebūtinai į šią atestaciją, kai jo, jis jo, jis jo, jo. Bet, bet teoriškai tai yra, nu, kaip ir įmanoma. Tema iš vis ne problema. Jo. Tai yra jūsų susitarimas su vadovė, kada tu sutari tris kartus, penkis kartus, dešimt kartų jo. gali keisti. Nu, tik tai, jeigu tu dabar jau pasakysi, kad ten žadi kokius nors ten organinės, chemijos ne, ne, klausimus analizuotą, keičiausiai jau tada ir vadovą reikės keisti. Ne, ne, man tiesiog nu, atrodo, kad truputėlį racionaliau eiti ten, kur aš dirbu, nes iš tu atžiai jau per ten, kur aš mokiausi ir kur, taip sakant, ta patirtis iš mokslo buvo daugiau, bet vis tiek mano ir darbas dabar ir darbas ateitį. Tai inovacijų agentūrai, tai iš tikrųjų turėtų būti labai dinamiška aplinka ir, mm. ir, ir tas pats darbas, tai, tai tikrai yra, yra smagu, tik tai tiek, kad tu labai įvadybą pereisi, žinai, jau tada tikrai įvadybą pereisi, žinai, inovacijų vadybą. Tai vat, kad labai toksai, bet jie visiškai nauja ir skyrių kūrė, ta prasme, su, nu, dėl to sako, toks labai gera, kaip sakant, vieta ir, ir laikas ir visa kita. Ir, taip, taip, taip. Jo, tas pereimas yra, būtų toks jau grinai vadybinis, bet iš kitos pusės labai įdomu, nes nu, mano patirtis ane ir su, ir su klasteriais dirbant, ir su įmainėm ir va, to pačiu universitetu, man rodo, aš ir katalūnui pridėtinės vertės daugiau galbūt netgi galėčiau sukurti iš, iš tos inovacijos gepūros pusės, nes iš esmės jie šnekai yra apie priemonio, nekurima būtent, nu, ką, ką pas mišės, sakai, intelekt, nes nuo savybės ne, 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 neišaiškinam, kodėl ten reikia, okay. tai gal kai žmogus jau išvidaus būtų. Tai va, bet to pačiu norisi kažkaip ir tą tyrimą pasakyti. O jo, kad... o kaip tu galvoji, kokia čia tema tau būtų, ar, ta prasme, ka, koks objektas tyrimų tau čia būtų įdomesnis? Iš esmės, aš kaip galvoju, čia truptelis skaičiausi, iš esmės pats darbas bus su ekosistema. Ne? Tai yra gyvybas mokslo, meteho, bioteho, inovacijų ekosistemos Lietuvoje 
iš pradžių išsiažkinimas, pas paskui plėtojimas. Nes ką jie dabar va, yra nusimatę, na, kad ta sistema yra tokia pakankamai, na, ne, 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 iki galo neišgrįdinta. Tai, 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 tai aš nuok tau galiu porą gerų straipsnių atsiųstite uh-huh. tema, nes ir Adneris, ir Būr, ir Džekobidės, tai yra tokie klasikai tėvai ekosistemos teorijų, kurios, nu, nu kuriuo aš tau pradėčiau, pasiūlyčiau pradėti jo. visą tą darbą. Ir šiandien ant bangos yra iš tikrųjų ekosistemų, ekosistemų, ekosistemų analizė, nes, žinai, kodėl yra ant bangos, nes nuo jos priklauso visos inovacijos, nes visos inovacijos paremtos dabartinės vertės grindinimo, vertės grindinės eina prie ekosistemos dalyvius ir jeigu nėra ekosistemos, tos vertinės grindinės yra fragmentuotos. Taip. Iš principo ir, 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 pavyzdžiui, pas mus yra beda, aš čia prieš 15 metų bandžiau įrodyt tuo metiniai valdžiai, kad pastatyti slėnį neveiks dėl to, kad nu, jeigu tu ištės infrastruktūrą ir padarai kelius, bet neturi nei vieno dispečerio, kuris reguliuotų ten nu, jeigu analogai su rauostu ar ne, lėktuvų srautą, nu tai ko tu tikėsi iš tų, iš tų pastatų, ar ne, kurios pastatėjai, nes jeigu ten trūksta žmonių, trūksta e, tinklų, trūksta kompetencijos, tai pastatai čia nieko nepadės, žinai, tai, tai va visokių tokių niuansų, bet, bet jo, labai įdomu, gerai, tai nėra lengva tema, bet, bet manau, kad jinai yra labai perspektyvi iš tikrųjų. Nu tai vat, ir man tai patinka tai, kad ir iš tikrųjų prie tos Lietuvos tokias geros būtų prisidedama vėlgi iš, iš abiejų pusių, nes jų tikslas yra dabar tam te patarau kelti ir tą vertę kuriamą trumpinti turiu omeny proceso prasme, ne, nes kaip jūs sako, to verties grandinė yra ilga ir iki galo yra neaišku nei per ką, nei mm. per kur, čia tos konsultavimai visokie, kurios teikia ir, ir krūvą agentūrų, ir universitetai, ir dar šiai privatus konsultantai ir panašiai. Ir... ir, ir Pati sektoriai ties gyvybės mokslo, kaip jie sako, nu, nėra iki gal mes dar įsigyminę, kur ten Lietuvoje pas mus yra tos stiprios tos pusės, kaip ir yra ne tos 3-4 specializacijos, bet na. Nu jo, bet pirmas dalykas reikia nepamiršti skaitmenos, ko, ko dar gyvybės mokslus labai sunkiai ateina. Na, kadangi aš pirmai 20 metų su valstybė dirbu, tai, tai, tai šitoje srityje, žinai, pakankamai gerai įsivaizduoju tą situaciją, tai, tai, tai yra tas trūkumas, kad digital, žinai, Health ar digital life science, tai pas mus labai apleista sritis yra, nes vis dar labai su to hardcore labai susisėjo, tai yra labai didelis praradimas, nes kaip minės paslaugos, už tos prinės paslaugos sudaro didžiąją dalį su kaimininių, kaip pavyzdžiui, Skandinavijos šalių Taip. ekonomikos dalį, pas mus prinės aukštos prinės vertės paslaugos yra labai žemoji situacija, labai prastoji situacija, labai mažai mes uždirbam lyginant, sakau, su Skandinavijos sritim. O kitas dalykas, tai, tai va, ir tų ekosistemos dalyvių įmonių, tų, kurios gali kažką daryti, žinai, yra, yra pakankamai mažai, yra viena, tai žinai, ir mes jas pastoviai nutampom. Nu, vien žodžiu, gerai atsritis iš principų yra ką veikti, bet... Jeigu turėtume bet... daugiau laiko, tai žinokit, pasiūlyčiau ir jums eitę, sakau, dabar ir ten ir tas skyriaus vadovo ieško ir visko, tai... Bet aš pradėjau, kad jis Tai tu dar... Bet o maktai, aš dabar, kadangi su LMT valdybui, tai man būtų interesų konfliktas į inovacijų agentūrą. Nu, ta prasme, kad taip, taip, negali taip. dvejose tos institucijose būti. Bet... Bet ką norėjau pasakyti, pagrindinis dalykas, ir aišku, Lietuvoje irgi čia svarbu yra, bet Lietuva negali išgyventi bet tautinių vertės grandinių. Tai va, greičiausiai tas sankaba su globaliom vertės grandinėm. Čia yra esmė, kad mes čia trumpintume return on investment žinai, ciklą. Aišku, vidu irgi reikia atvarkyti, žinai, vienas kitą jo. neeliminuoja. Bet... Na, na. <laughs> Sakysiu, pasius konsultuotis daim, tai reikės. Labai įdomi tema, ne? Tikrai jo. ne prieš. <laughs> Ja, man, tai tu tarp kitko, vat šitą keistą džiustų, tu pasidarink jo. būtent šitą klausimą, tu prasigildensi, pasižiūrėsi, kaip jisai atrodo, pasimsi literatūrą. Einu, aš dabar iš karto gal atsiūsiu gerai, iki sekančio posėdžio, kad, kad tu pasižiūrėtume ir tu paskui straipsnio galia pasižiūrėti kitus straipsnius, kurie jie situoja. Ir... Va, tai, tai aš manau, tu tą keistą ir pasidaryk ant šitos temos, tai bus toks įvadas ir... ir... Būtų paiku. 
Gerasi, paprastai, žinom, mes sakau, šiek tiek baisoka buvo, nes galvoju, tiek čia kaip ir kitas rytis, kad iš naujo stok reikės dar kalas. Tematikos ir tikrai ne problemo, o sakau, astą pakankamai, sakau, ir brandus ir stipus vadovas, kad jinai sugebėtų vadovau šitai temai, o kitas dalykas, tai visada gali turėti konsultantus ir vieną ir turis visi ir penkis. Tai labai lauks straipsnių atšinti. Ei, nusius. Gerai, tai sėkmės tau. Taigi.